Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is geometric topology. I guess today it's time to finally resolve this left and right handed trefoil nonsense. And I will do it using kind of the Jones polynomial, um, not quite. I'm using a different polynomial which scales to the Jones polynomial, but it's slightly easier to explain. And it's called a bracket polynomial. It's again a polynomial invariant of knots. And I will tell you the story a little bit when we come to the definition, but first, or kind of the main statement, but first we just get started because it's just so simple it's kind of the back of the envelope calculation in the end okay so here is the idea um, again we use some local rule obviously that's what we always do in this kind of topology uh, whatever um, but let's me define what one could call the Kaufman skein calculus um, and the last one is called the Kaufman skein relation or the Kaufman skein or whatever whatever you want to call it and I would I like to associate a polynomial to a knot and the polynomial is called a bracket polynomial and it's denoted, what a surprise, by a bracket. And I do it in the following way. Um, so first I just say I have a normalization. I just say whenever I see something empty, it should be one. Okay, fine. I normalize empty not to one. Then it should always be some normalization. Okay, why not? I normalize empty not to one. And my polynomial is now polynomial in the variable A. I'm using the classical notation with A. Um, and the point is, whenever I have a circle just sitting in my diagram, so here I have a complicated knot, the goat knows, but I have a circle sitting in my diagram, which is not related to the knot at all, then I can just pull out the factor, well, this factor here, minus a squared, well, plus a to the minus two. We will see actually where that factor comes from. And then just the bracket of the knot, uh, which is certainly, it's now not just, it, this should be the same knot as below, just with the circle removed. So you remove the circle um, and you get a factor. So you just pulling out circles gives you a factor. Okay, so this means whenever I have a bunch of circles, you can just reduce the diagram by just pulling out all the circles. Eventually you hit the empty diagram, the empty diagram is normalized to one. So you can evaluate the polynomial on all circles. And in order to get circles, here comes a relation. You replace a crossing by, well, by two smoothings of the crossing. And we'll see in a second that this is enough to uh, just give you a bunch of circles associated to a, to a knot. And there's some scalars around, which we will explain in a second. But this is kind of the main idea. So we have some recursion again, some version of recursion, very similar to the Alexander Conway polynomial, um, but much easier in some sense. We'll see how that works. And the main idea is that you have a linear relation among the um, the diagrams with four points here, namely the first diagram with four points that you can draw, the crossing is equal to a linear combination of those guys here, the other naively, the other diagrams you would naively draw with four points. And you would like to use this linear relation to just compute the polynomial. Okay, let's have a look at how this works actually. So if you do those calculations yourself, it's actually really a back of an envelope calculation. You just need to do it. Um, might be a little bit too quick, but I will do my best. So here we have this uh, knot, which is actually a link. It's called the hop link, has two crossings and I do the following manipulation. So I basically only care about the two crossings because the only thing that I need is a local relation around the crossings. And I don't really care what's outside. It just connects like this anyway. And I just list all the four ways to resolve the crossing. So for example, I could resolve the top one like this, picking up a factor, let's see, a inverse, yeah, a inverse, and I could resolve this bottom one like this, picking up a factor uh, a. So we can actually pick up a factor a here, uh, which of course a inverse times a is just one. And I still have my diagram closed here. Uh, perfect. So this should be one of the diagrams and it's indeed this one here. And I just add all of the corresponding solutions. So here I have resolved both crossings uh, vertically, here horizontal, vertical, uh, or vertical, horizontal, and uh, horizontal and horizontal. I just add up everything and I see a bunch of circles, as you can see. So here I have two circles, here I have one circle, here I have one circle, here I have two circles, and I just get the circle scalar uh, to the corresponding power because I just can pull out the, the circle using this relation, the second relation, pulling out the circle. And that's it. Whatever you get, I haven't factored it. I haven't simplified it. You can now expand it and simplify it. Whatever you get is a polynomial. 
a polynomial in A in this case, or in A and A inverse, actually. And um, yeah, so that will be an invariant of the knot, and it's super easy to compute. You just take your knot, you just write down all the resolutions horizontal, vertically, just keep track of the scalars A, pull out all the circles, and that's it. Um, it's actually, to compute, this is actually really, really easy to compute. And the point is that this linear relation in the crossing actually gets rid of the crossing. And a knot without crossing should be reasonably simple. And that's exactly what happens here. So let's actually prove now, it's really, really beautiful, beautiful argument to Kaufman, prove that this um, actually is a knot invariant is really, really simple. So um, the idea is really, let's assume, and I remove the brackets here, the brackets are just disturbing. Uh, so let's assume we have a linear relation among the diagrams, something with an A and something with a B, the crossing is A times B, uh, A times horizontal and B times vertical, sorry, the other way around, A times vertical and B times horizontal. Okay, and what we want is we want the Rademeister 2 relation to hold, right? We want the identity to be, oh, well, the Rademeister 2 move. And so we just re resolve the Rademeister 2 move exactly in the way I've done it here. Do I, again, uh, what is it? Um, horizon vertically, horizontally, and so on. So here, and here, here, and here, here, and here, here, and here. We just have to be a little bit careful because one of the crossings goes like this and one of the crossings goes like this. And uh, this means you need to turn your head in this resolution if it goes uh, in, in the 90 degree version. Anyway, you, you collect scalars, so you get all of these scalars here, fine. And as you can see, we want it to be this guy here. So we just look at the scalar in front of this guy. There's only one diagram which looks like that entity. And this should give us that A equals B inverse. So let's have a look. Indeed, A equals B inverse because B is just A inverse in this case. Right? So this gives us the first relation among the power parameters. And then you look uh, at the rest. And they are all the same diagram, as you can see, up to this factor of the circle that you pull out. So the rest then gives you a relation um, among those numbers here that should, should give zero in the end because the diagram doesn't appear on the other side. And you will get, in this case, that the circle is exactly what it, what it is supposed to be on um, the, the pulling out circle relations, which kind of means that there's, this is a unique solution to the Rademeister invariance. You can now check Rademeister 3, and it's kind of the same calculation, just a little bit more demanding. It doesn't give you anything new. Um, and that's kind of the point. The whole idea here is that there should be a relation among the points, and there's only one way, well, like a relation among the diagrams with four points, and there's only one way to fill it in, in or a unique way to fill it in, uh, such that the Rademeister relation is uh, satisfied. And well, we are looking for not invariant, so we definitely want the Rademeister relations to be satisfied. So basically, this gives a not invariant by construction, and basically, we obtained it by playing with Rademeister moves. And then the statement is kind of uh, pretty cool. So up to the stupid uh, first Rider Master move, which is not quite an invariant, it's an invariant up to a stu stupid scalar that you scale out. It's not really important, you just scale it out. Up to that stupid uh, scalar, um, the po bracket polynomial is a not invariant. So appropriately rescaled, it actually is a not invariant. Um, and it is a polynomial with integer coefficients by definition, basically, and um, A and A inverse as coefficients. And that's pretty good. And up to scaling, it's not it's a well-known uh, Jones polynomial. So we can actually take this as a definition of the Jones polynomial. And I won't define the Jones polynomial in any other way. Um, uh, historically speaking, it was defined very differently from coming from von Neumann algebras and some Tepperly deep calculus. Um, and kind of the story here is so the Jones polynomial that was roughly around 85. It really changed uh, not theory drastically. It just was a game changer. Um, nobody saw that coming. It just pop, popped out of the blue. It's a really simple and powerful environment at the same time. And it turns out that, that this process was not covering in this video. It has zillions of connections to other fields, as just mentioned, for Neumann algebras, which is a part of functional analysis. Which a priori has absolutely no relations to not theory at all. So this was really a game changer. It was kind of a fun story um, that uh, some people call it the Biermann-Jones polynomial because apparently, so Jones found this description um, using the von Neumann algebras, but never actually considered any not invariant because you're doing von Neumann algebras. So 
structured analysis. Why should you think about not invariance? And then Birman said, hmm, maybe you should think about taking some trace here because it looks like a Markov trace property. And two years later or one year later, uh, Jones took the trace and that was history of mathematics and its making. So the Jones polynomial is one of the major breakthroughs in general in mathematics in the last century. And Jones was awarded the Fields Medal for this breakthrough. And it, it becomes more and more apparent that the Jones polynomial is really at the heart of many, many different uh, fields of mathematics and, and physics. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And it's super simple to define and super simple to compute. And in the end, it just boils down to having a linear relation between all the pictures you can draw with four points. Okay, and one of the main applications, oh, well, not one of the main applications, one of the uh, applications Jones had actually in the Jones polynomial in the original paper is, yay, we can distinguish now the left and the right-handed trefoil. So I decided to write down the Jones polynomial, which has a slight rescaling that would rescale the parameter A to a different parameter that I call Q, but otherwise it's really just a bracket polynomial. And as you can see, they are different, hey, they're related by a very nice symmetry, sending Q to Q inverse. Um, but they're different. So they're different. They're different. What well, this is great. So the, the, the dots are not the same. The left and right-handed prefer. Finally, the left and right-handed prefer are actually different. And that was really a shock. Really came as a shock. So it, it was known already. So Dean proved in uh, 1914 or something that they are different using very very complicated methods. Uh, complicated in the sense of that this is really easy. You can now sit down and do the calculation yourself. You can prove yourself that this is that this is uh, that these are different. And and all the other classical not invariants that I showed you in the previous, I got God knows how many videos, they all fail to detect this, um, this mirror image here, the left and the right-handed trefoil, the Jones polynomial does. And that's just, that's just really, really good. So I said again, it was not like this was not known before. The point was that you can get it so easily by using the Jones polynomial. And before that, you had to do a very, very complicated yoga or maybe let's say complicated yoga. Let's just drop the very, very, whatever that means anyway. And well, you, you still, there was a proof by Dean, uh, but it was just much more complicated. Anyway, so the bracket polynomial or the Jones polynomial, they're kind of the same anyway. Super easy to define using this idea of a linear relation um, between the diagrams, basically. And in the end, it's just a really, really strong and cool knot invariant. And it's not just important because it's a knot invariant. It connects so many fields of mathematics. I, I can't even sketch that. So uh, let me say it again. The original definition came from, from Neumann algebras, which is... Uh, Functional analysis. This is very different looking field, and it spits out the Jones polynomial. And you can play around with it. Quantum physics going and representation theory and all that junk. Um, it's really, really amazing. And the Jones polynomial clearly changed history of uh, knot theory. Um, it was really, really a breakthrough. Anyway, I hope you do some calculations with the Jones polynomial of a back end of an envelope. And I also hope you enjoyed the video. And I also hope to see you next time.